Ability Seminar. Um, so just to remind those of you who've just joined us, um, we're going to be recording this seminar. So if you would like uh, to not appear in any of the recording, please make sure to keep your video off and your sound muted. Otherwise, if you'd like to have your video on, it's nice for us to see that there's an audience out there. Um, so uh, we've put the slides for Nina's talk on the web if you'd like to have a look at them. So um, I've just put the link in the chat. Um, so as usual, we'll take questions in the chat and then Alex or I will sort of interrupt Nina if it's something we feel that needs to be dealt with immediately or we'll take it at the end as appropriate. Um, and it remains only for me to uh, give a very warm welcome to Nina Holden. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nina. And Nina's going to talk about Liouville quantum gravity with a matter central charge in 1 up to 25, a probabilistic approach. Thanks very much, Nina. Yeah, uh, thanks very much for the introduction. And also thanks to, uh, and thanks to Christina and Alex for, uh, for inviting me to give a talk. Um, yes, I will be talking about uh, Liouville quantum gravity with central charge between 1 and uh, 25, uh, which is based on a collaboration with uh, Ewan Gwynn, Josh Pfeffer and uh, Guillaume Remy. Uh, so we start by asking the question, uh, how can you sample a surface uniformly at random? Uh, to answer this question, we first need to specify what we mean by a surface, uh, and then we need to put some uh, natural probability measure on this set of, of surfaces. Uh, one natural way to approach the problem uh, is to discretize it. Um, so a planar map is a natural model for a discrete uh, surface, uh, and we get a random surface by putting the uniform probability measure on some finite collection of planar maps. Uh, to be a bit more precise, um, a planar map is a graph uh, which is drawn on the sphere uh, and which is viewed modulo continuous deformations. Uh, for example, the left and the middle planar maps uh, in the figure uh, are considered to be the same since we can get from one to the other by applying a continuous deformation. Uh, the middle and uh, the right planar map, on the other hand, are not considered to be the same. Um, so again, we can get from one to the other by doing some uh, deformation, but, uh, but this deformation is not uh, continuous. Uh, for some natural number n, uh, there are finitely many uh, planar maps that have exactly n edges, uh, and we get uh, a uniform uh, surface uh, by sampling a planar map uniform at random from such a finite collection of uh, planar maps. Uh, a natural number is what happens, uh, happens when you send n to infinity. Uh, we can ask whether uh, the planar map uh, is converging in some sense uh, in the scaling limit. Uh, to answer this question, uh, we first need to specify um, uh, for, for which topology uh, we want to prove convergence. Uh, one possibility is to view the planar map as uh, a metric measure space. Um, so a planar map is a metric space uh, if we equip it with a graph distance, uh, and it is a metric measure space if we also give each vertex a certain mass. Uh, it turns out that in order for the diameter of the map uh, to remain of order one when we send n to infinity, uh, then we should let adjacent vertices uh, have distance uh, of order n to the power minus a quarter. And we also give each vertex uh, mass, uh, 1 over n, uh, such that the total mass remains of order 1 when n goes to infinity. Uh, it has been proved by uh, Logal Mirmont uh, and others uh, that several classes of uniformly sampled planar maps uh, converge in the scaling limit, uh, viewed as metric measure spaces, uh, to the Brownian map. Uh, so the Brownian map uh, is some uh, continuum abstract uh, metric measure space. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, another possibility uh, is, to, uh, is to consider convergence of uh, planar maps under conformal embedding. Uh, so, uh, okay, have I gone one step too far? Yeah. Uh, so here you can see, um, uh, yes, you, uh, so, you're, so you may remember that uh, a planar map is only defined uh, up to continuous deformations, uh, so there's not a unique uh, way to draw it. Uh, and in the figure, you can see the same planar map, uh, which has been drawn in, uh, in two different ways. Uh, in the left figure, uh, one has attempted to draw the planar map uh, such that the different edges have a length which is as close as possible. Uh, while in uh, the right figure, uh, the planar map has been embedded into the Euclidean sphere S2. Uh, there are various ways to define uh, embeddings, um, uh, which can be viewed as discrete approximations uh, to conformal maps. Uh, so when we embed uh, the planar map uh, on the sphere, uh, then we get a metric and a measure on the sphere. Um, so we, give, so we, get, uh, we get the measure uh, by saying that the mass of some open set uh, is equal to the mass of the vertices contained in the set. Uh, and we get uh, a metric uh, by saying that, um, uh, that the distance between two points on the sphere is proportional to the graph distance between the closest embedded vertices uh, to these points. Um, 
Yeah, uh, and uh, it is uh, believed that for a large class of discrete conformal embeddings, uh, this metric and this measure converge in the scaling limit, uh, such that the limiting object uh, does not depend uh, on the precise uh, choice of, of discrete conformal embedding. Uh, the limiting object uh, in this uh, convergence result uh, is, is known as a Liouville uh, quantum gravity surface, um, and that's the object uh, that I want to introduce next. Um, so in order to introduce level quantum gravity, we first need to introduce the Gaussian free field. Um, so we consider um, some rescale version of Z2 restricted to the unit square. Um, and then uh, if we have a function defined on the vertices of this graph, uh, then we can define its Hamiltonian by considering the sum of the squared um, differences between adjacent uh, function values. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so then uh, the discrete uh, Gaussian free field, it is a random function, uh, which is defined such that the product relative, uh, such that, such that uh, the density relative to the product of a Lebesgue measure on, on the vertices uh, is proportional to e to the power uh, minus the Hamiltonian. Uh, so in other words, the discrete Gaussian free field uh, is a random function, which is sampled such that we favor functions uh, where adjacent function values are not too different. Uh, in order to get a finite measure or a probability measure, we need to introduce some additional constraints. Um, and for example, it's possible to introduce some uh, boundary data. Um, so from this definition of uh, the discrete Gaussian free field, uh, it's possible to argue that uh, if we consider any fixed point, uh, then the value of the discrete Gaussian free field uh, is a normal random variable. Uh, and it is a normal random variable with a variance of order log n. Um, and there is also uh, some covariance between the di uh, distinct points. So the covariance is logarithmic in the inverse distance between the points. Uh, and if we fix the boundary data to be zero, then the expected value of the normal random variable will, will also be equal uh, to zero. Uh, so one way to define the continuum Gaussian free field uh, is to say that there's the limit of the discrete Gaussian free field as n goes to infinity. Uh, so since, uh, since we can see that the value of the discrete Gaussian free field uh, is diverging uh, logarithmically um, as n goes to infinity, uh, then, uh, then, it's not, uh, then it's not clear how to make sense of, uh, of the continuum Gaussian free field. Uh, and in particular, uh, the continuum Gaussian free field is too rough and uh, irregular to be well defined as a function. Um, but it is possible to show uh, that um, uh, the continuum Gaussian free field uh, is well defined uh, as a generalized function or uh, a distribution. Uh, so it means that we can't evaluate it pointwise, but we can, for example, uh, integrate it against some uh, smooth test function. Uh, so one way to define uh, a level quantum gravity surface is to say that it is uh, the surface uh, is, is to say that this is a surface which can be written on the form uh, e to the power gamma h uh, times the standard Euclidean metric. Uh, so here uh, gamma is some parameter between zero and two, uh, and h is uh, Gaussian free field or some uh, related kind of distribution. Uh, so this definition of a level quantum gravity surface does not make literal sense um, because h is a distribution and not a function, so it's not obvious what e to the power uh, gamma h means. Um, but it is possible to show that uh, various uh, observables uh, associated with the surface uh, can be defined uh, in a rigorous way. Uh, for example, it's possible to define uh, the area measure and uh, the distance function or metric uh, associated with uh, the surface. Uh, so the idea of uh, these constructions uh, is to let uh, h sub epsilon uh, be some uh, regularized version of h. Uh, then we can use uh, h sub epsilon uh, to define a measure and uh, a metric. Uh, and then we can show that this uh, metric and this uh, measure is uh, converging uh, when this uh, regularization parameter epsilon uh, is sent to zero. Uh, so the construction of uh, measures of this kind uh, is classical and goes back to the 70s and 80s, uh, while the construction of um, a metric or distance function of this kind uh, is a much harder problem, uh, and the construction was only completed uh, last year. Uh, so, um, uh, so a metric and uh, a measure of this kind, it can be constructed uh, for any value of gamma between uh, 0 and 2. Um, but the particular value, gamma equal to the square root of h search, is playing a special role. Uh, and this is often called a uh, purely level quantum gravity. Uh, and this is playing a special role because it corresponds to the scaling limit of uh, uniformly sampled planar maps. Uh, so, so far we have seen that even from the sample planar maps, uh, it converges in two different senses uh, in the scaling limit. Uh, so viewed as abstract metric measure spaces, they converge to the Brownian map. 
uh, and under under conformal embedding, uh, they converge to Lyell quantum gravity, um, where the parameter gamma is equal to the square root of eight thirds. Uh, Miller and Sheffield proved in the series of works uh, that the Brownian map is actually equivalent uh, to Lyell quantum gravity. Um, so to be more precise, uh, they proved that an instance of the Brownian map uh, has a canonical embedding uh, into the complex plane, uh, such that the induced measure and metric uh, is equal in law uh, to a Lyell quantum gravity surface. Uh, so in particular, uh, the metric measure space associated with a Lyell quantum gravity surface um, is equal in law to the Brownian map. Uh, so, so far in the talk, we have been looking at uh, uniform uh, random surfaces. Um, so in conformal field theory and uh, string theory in the 80s, uh, people were also interested in certain uh, non-uniform uh, random surfaces. Uh, so in particular, people including, for example, Pulyakov uh, was interested in surfaces whose law has been reweighted in a certain sense uh, by the determinant of the Laplacian. Uh, so, as so we can ask what this means, um, so in the discrete setting, it's, uh, it's immediate what this means, or it's, it's, it's immediate to how, how one can make sense of this. Um, so to make sense of it, one can let C be some uh, parameter that we call the matter central charge. Uh, then we uh, let big M uh, be a random planar map, uh, which has been sampled such that the prob probability that the map is equal to some fixed map uh, little m. Uh, is proportional to the determinant of the Laplacian to the power uh, minus uh, c over two. Uh, so here, the Laplacian uh, is a particular linear operator, which is uh, which is defined in terms of the adjacency matrix of um, of the map. Uh, so one reason such planar maps are interesting um, is the physics heuristic, which is saying that if c is a positive integer, uh, then the law of the planar map, which is sampled in such in such a way in some sense has been reweighted uh, by the number of ways of embedding uh, M uh, in uh, C-dimensional space. Uh, I can also mention the Kirchhoff's uh, matrix uh, tree theorem, which is saying that the determinant of the Laplacian is equal to the number of distinct spanning trees uh, that the planar map allows. Uh, the DDK ansatz uh, is a physics heuristic, uh, which is saying that these non-uniform planar maps are also related uh, to Lyell quantum gravity. Uh, so according to the DDK ansatz, uh, this planar map M uh, is converging in the scaling limit uh, to a Lyell quantum gravity surface, uh, such that the parameters uh, gamma and C uh, are related by the shown formula. Uh, so the DDK ansatz uh, is stated for uh, the material central charge C uh, less than or equal to one, uh, which corresponds to the parameter gamma ranging between uh, zero and two. Um, so uh, if you remember the previous slide, uh, then uh, the convergence results stated here, uh, they are a verification of uh, the DDK ansatz uh, in the particular case when C is equal to zero, uh, which corresponds to gamma equal to the square root of eight thirds uh, and the case of uh, uniformly sampled planar maps. Um, so the mathematical uh, understanding of the DDK ansatz uh, is not as good uh, when C is uh, not equal to zero. And in particular, none of the convergence results uh, stated on the previous slide uh, have been uh, verified uh, when C is not equal to zero. Um, but there is some uh, mathematical progress uh, also when C, uh, also for other values of C, uh, less than or equal to one. Um, so it is believed and uh, in certain cases proved uh, that the determinant of the Laplacian to the power um, or to the power minus C over two, um, it is equal to or can be approximated by the partition function of some statistical uh, physics model. Uh, so uh, the figure is showing some examples. Um, so for example, we can see from the figure that uh, C equal to one half, uh, it corresponds to the Ising model. Uh, so therefore, uh, if we want to sample a planar map uh, in the C equal to one half uh, universality class, uh, then one way to do this uh, is to sample it as such that the probability um, that the planar map is equal to a given planar map uh, is proportional to the Ising model partition function of, on this uh, planar map. Um, and it has been uh, proved for uh, several planar maps uh, reweighted by the partition function of some statistical physics model uh, that, uh, that they converge in the scaling limit uh, in the topology, which is known as the mating of trees topology. Uh, so this is a topology which is not uh, directly capturing a metric or conformal properties uh, of the planar map. Um, uh, but, but instead, uh, convergence in this, in this topology uh, involves convergence uh, of a particular observable uh, of the planar map. Um, it has also been proved that several uh, exponents associated with planar maps uh, are equal to the corresponding exponents for uh, Lyell quantum gravity. 
Uh, for example, there, uh, there are various results for uh, stable maps. Uh, there are some results on nesting statistics in OOM and loop models. Uh, there are some results on the volume growth exponent for planar maps. Uh, some results on uh, the easing model uh, and so on. And there is also some very recent uh, progress by Ang Park, Pfeffer and uh, Sheffield. Um, so, so what they prove is that uh, Lee-Wall quantum gravity surfaces for different values of gamma uh, are related by doing a reweighting by the Laplacian determinant. Uh, so in other words, they make sense of a reweighting by the Laplacian determinant uh, directly in the continuum. Uh, and they show that uh, Lee-Wall quantum gravity surfaces are um, for, different, for different parameters uh, are related upon doing uh, a reweighting by this uh, Laplacian determinant. Uh, so in this slide, you can see um, the simulations of uh, planar maps for uh, three different values of C. Uh, so in particular, uh, the rightmost figure corresponds to the case of uh, uniform planar maps and C equal to zero. Uh, while in the two other figures, you can see uh, planar maps for, for smaller values of, of C. Uh, so you can see that the, the, so the, so the figure is uh, suggesting uh, that as C is going to minus infinity, uh, then the geometry of the planar map uh, gets closer and closer to the geometry of, of the standard Euclidean sphere. Uh, conversely, uh, when C is uh, large, uh, then the planar map uh, will typically be very fractal and have uh, long, narrow uh, tentacles. Uh, and it is conjectured uh, in the physics literature that when C is uh, greater than one, uh, then the planar map uh, is converting in the scaling limit uh, to a continuum a random tree. Uh, so to sum up what we have seen so far, um, so we have seen that if we consider uh, random planar maps uh, reweighted by the Laplace determinant to some power, uh, then if the central charge C is less than one, uh, then we get a Lewell quantum gravity in the scaling limit where the parameter gamma goes between zero and two. Uh, while if C is uh, greater than one, uh, then we believe that uh, we get the continuum uh, random tree. Uh, so if we look at the formula that relates uh, C and gamma and we plug in a value of C which is greater than one, uh, then the value of gamma uh, will be complex. Uh, one natural question um, is whether it's possible to define some non-trivial geometry for Lewell quantum gravity uh, when C is uh, greater than one. Uh, so one of the main um, uh, so one of the main uh, goals uh, of this um, of this talk. Um, is to address uh, this question, um, and we will see that the answer to the question is uh, yes. Uh, so when C is um, between one and 25, um, then, uh, then um, uh, it is possible to define some uh, non-trivial geometry uh, for Lewell quantum gravity. Um, okay, so uh, so far in the talk, uh, we have seen that uh, Lee wall quantum gravity, um, we have seen that random planar maps is representing some natural discretization of uh, Lee wall quantum gravity surface. Um, and now we will be looking at uh, another uh, natural discretization of uh, an LQG surface. Um, yeah, so, uh, so this other uh, discretization, we call it the square subdivision model. Uh, so to, to, so to uh, describe the square subdivision, uh, then, we let, um, then we consider uh, the unit square and we consider the Gaussian field field uh, in the unit square. Uh, and we divide uh, the unit square into four uh, smaller parts. Um, and uh, we will do the same thing again. Uh, and we do the same thing one more time. Uh, so before we started this uh, square subdivision, uh, then we had fixed some uh, small parameter epsilon. Uh, and every time uh, we reach a square, which has Lee wall quantum gravity area, which is uh, smaller than epsilon, uh, then we don't divide the square. Uh, so in particular, uh, you can see that the three uh, bigger squares uh, in the figure, uh, they all have a Lee wall quantum gravity area, which is smaller than uh, epsilon. Uh, so here I've subdivided again, uh, and now we have reached even more squares, which have uh, area less than epsilon. Uh, and we keep subdividing uh, until all the squares in the figure uh, have level quantum gravity area, which is smaller than uh, epsilon. Uh, so here is the exact same figure again, uh, except that it is, uh, except that I've given the different squares a different color, uh, depending on the side length. Uh, and here, uh, here is again the same picture, uh, except that it is for uh, a simulation of uh, level quantum gravity uh, in the case when gamma is equal to 1.5, uh, which corresponds to C being approximately uh, minus one. 
Um, so here is a simulation for uh, three different values of uh, C and gamma. Uh, as you can see in the rightmost figure that when uh, gamma or equivalently C are large, uh, then there will be some regions with uh, very big squares and some regions with very small squares. Uh, where, whereas if gamma and C are smaller, uh, then uh, the square size uh, is, is not as uh, variable. And so this is natural because uh, the Gaussian free field gives a bigger distortion of a uh, Lebesgue measure uh, when, uh, um, when the value of gamma is larger. As you may recall from earlier, uh, that um, a Lewell quantum uh, gravity surface, um, it, it is equipped with uh, an area measure mu uh, and a distance function or a metric d. Uh, so we can let uh, d sub c uh, be the Hausdorff dimension of uh, the metric space, which is defined by this uh, metric uh, big D. Um, so then uh, it was recently shown by Ang Falconet and Sun uh, that if we look at uh, the Lewell quantum gravity area uh, of um, a metric ball, uh, then this is growing like uh, radius to the power uh, d sub c. Uh, so this is natural, um, because if we are in some d-dimensional space, uh, then uh, volumes typically scale like uh, the diameter uh, to the power d. Uh, so the precise value of uh, d sub c is not known, um, and the figure is showing the best known, um, upper, the, the best known rigorous upper and lower bounds uh, for d sub c. Uh, the green curve is showing a uh, physics prediction known as the Watabeke prediction, uh, but this has actually been uh, disproved. Uh, in the case when uh, gamma is uh, gamma is very close to zero. Uh, in the right figure, you can see some simulations of uh, metric balls um, for two different values of gamma and C. Uh, so the black points are the points which have distance more than one from the center of the square. Uh, and while otherwise, uh, the colors are indicating the distance from the point uh, to the center of the square. Uh, so going back to this uh, square subdivision, uh, then we can observe that the square subdivision uh, is uh, is defining a planar map. Uh, so we define a planar map uh, if we um, identify each square uh, with the vertex of the planar map, uh, and we say that uh, two uh, vertices are adjacent uh, if and only if uh, the corresponding squares uh, share a boundary segment. Uh, so I fix uh, one vertex uh, of this planar map, uh, and I call it the center. Uh, so this is the vertex you can see in black. Uh, and then we can look at uh, metric balls in the planar map. Uh, so in this figure, you can see the metric ball centered at, uh, at the black vertex, uh, and which has radius uh, equal to one. Uh, here we can see the metric ball of uh, radius two. Here's the metric ball of radius three, uh, and so on. Uh, so one reason that this planar map of squares uh, is interesting uh, is because important properties uh, of the continuum surface uh, are reflected in this planar map of squares. Uh, for example, uh, volumes uh, in this planar map of squares uh, are also growing like radius to the power d sub c, uh, where d sub c is the Hausdorff dimension of the continuum surface. Um, so, uh, uh, so when we define the metric ball, then we consider the graph metric and uh, the volume of uh, the metric ball um, is defined to be the number of squares uh, which the metric ball contains. Um, so it has also been uh, proved uh, that for a closely related discretization of uh, the Lewell quantum gravity surface, uh, then this uh, planar map uh, is converging uh, to the original Lewell quantum gravity surface under what is, is known as the Tut embedding. Uh, the Tut embedding is a particular uh, discrete conformal embedding. Um, so both of these results, uh, they suggest that uh, the square subdivision of planar map uh, is a natural discreti discretization of the continuum surface, because important properties of the continuum surface uh, are captured by uh, the metric, by this uh, planar map. Um, yeah, so, uh, and uh, one can even conjecture that this planar map of squares uh, is converging in the scaling limit uh, to uh, the Lewell quantum gravity surface. Um, so we can consider uh, to two points, Z1 and Z2. Uh, we can consider uh, the graph distance uh, between these two points uh, in the planar map of squares. Uh, and then it's natural to conjecture that when uh, the square size of Salon uh, is sent to zero, then this uh, graph distance appropriately rescaled uh, is converging to the original uh, Lewell quantum uh, gravity metric uh, distance between these two points. 
Uh, I can mention that uh, Ding and Dunlap, they proved uh, tightness for a closely related metric. Uh, so they considered some uh, related discretization of a legal quantum gravity surface, and they defined uh, the pointwise distances uh, for, the, for this uh, discretization, and they were able to prove uh, tightness uh, for the metric. Um, yeah. Uh, and also that any subsequential limit is a biholder continuous relative to uh, to the to uh, the standard Euclidean metric. Um, so next we will see that um, level quantum gravity areas uh, they can be approximated in terms of uh, Gaussian free field averages. Uh, as we will see that uh, the level quantum gravity area of uh, the square s in the figure uh, it can be approximated in terms of uh, the average of the Gaussian free field uh, along the red circle. Uh, so more precisely, the Lyell quantum gravity area of the sphere of the square uh, to the power one over gamma is approximately equal to the side length of the square to the power q times e to the power of this uh, circle average, where the parameter q uh, is equal to two over gamma plus gamma over two, uh, and this is, and this parameter is known as the background charge. Uh, the table is showing uh, the relationship between the various um, between the various um, uh, parameters that we consider. Uh, in particular, the third column is corresponding to the case when c is less than or equal to 1, uh, and the fourth column corresponds to c between 1 and uh, 25. Uh, so what you can pay special attention to is that um, if we look at the parameter gamma, uh, then this is uh, real when c is less than or equal to 1, uh, while it's complex when c is between uh, 1 and 25. Uh, while this parameter q, on the other hand, uh, that parameter is, is real uh, both when c is less than or equal to 1 and when c is between uh, 1 and 25. Um, so by the approximation result on the previous slide, uh, then we see that we can uh, get an approximation uh, to the square subdivision uh, model by, uh, by considering Gaussian free field averages. As we define a new square subdivision uh, where we uh, divide a square if and only if the shown expression is uh, greater than epsilon. Uh, by the approximation result on the previous slide, uh, then this variant of the square subdivision model should be approximately equivalent uh, to the original version defined in terms of uh, Lyell quantum gravity uh, areas. Uh, but what is interesting about this uh, new version of the model is that uh, it also makes sense uh, when c is between uh, 1 and 25. Uh, so in order to define uh, the original version of the model, uh, then, uh, so the original version was defined in terms of level quantum gravity areas. Uh, so in, and in order to be able to define uh, LQG areas, uh, then we need the parameter gamma to be, uh, to be uh, between zero and two, and in particular to be real. Um, uh, whereas this uh, new version of the square subdivision uh, model, then we don't need the parameter gamma to be real, uh, but instead we need the parameter Q to be real because it's only the parameter Q which is involved in uh, the definition of, uh, of the model. Um, yeah, so uh, this uh, square subdivision model, uh, which is defined using Gaussian free field uh, averages, uh, that, uh, uh, this planar map uh, defined by, by, the, by the collection of squares, uh, that will be our model for Lyell quantum gravity when C is between uh, 1 and uh, 25. Uh, so the first property one can prove um, is that uh, this model is having uh, a phase transition at the point uh, c is equal to 1. Uh, so when c is uh, less than 1, uh, then uh, the square subdivision is uh, terminating with finitely many subdivisions uh, with probability 1. Uh, so uh, so uh, one way to see this is that uh, the, uh, is, is, is by using that the, the Lyell quantum gravity uh, error measure does not have uh, any atoms. Uh, so when c is between uh, 1 and 25, on the other hand, um, then it holds with probability converting to 1 uh, as epsilon goes to 0, that there will be certain, um, certain parts uh, of, of the square where we keep subdividing uh, squares forever. Uh, so in the figure, you can see that there are three regions uh, containing points where we keep subdividing squares uh, forever. Uh, and we view these points uh, as points which have uh, infinite mass. Uh, so this is um, so it's natural to interpret them as points of infinite mass uh, because a square subdivision is defined such that each square uh, has approximately the same uh, level quantum gravity uh, area. Uh, it's possible to show that there is uh, a dense set uh, of such infinite mass points um, such that for any point in this set uh, then we keep subdividing squares forever uh, when the parameter epsilon uh, is sufficiently small. Uh, and so these sets 
uh, so these infinite mass points, uh, they correspond to so-called uh, thick points uh, of, uh, of the Gaussian free field. Uh, so for a fixed small uh, value of epsilon, then a uh, simulation is typically looking like on the figure. So you can see that there are a few, a few clusters of points where we keep subdividing forever, uh, while um, when, uh, when we send epsilon to zero, then there will be more and more regions uh, where, we, where we keep subdividing squares uh, forever. As you may remember from uh, earlier, that if we have a, a random planar map uh, whose law is uh, reweighted by the Laplacian determinant uh, to some power, then um, uh, then if c is greater than one, uh, then it is believed that we get a continuum random tree in the scaling limit. Uh, for this reason, we can view a, the continuum random tree uh, as a finite volume model for level quantum gravity with c uh, greater than one. And we view it as a finite volume model because both the diameter and the total mass uh, of the continuum random tree uh, is finite. Uh, our model uh, for level quantum gravity with C between 1 and 25, on the other hand, uh, it has a very different nature. Uh, and we can view it as uh, an infinite volume model uh, for level quantum gravity uh, with C between 1 and 25. Uh, so we view it as an infinite volume model because we have these points of uh, infinite mass and which lie at uh, infinite distance uh, from the rest of uh, the surface. Uh, so, so one question you may have is, is whether our model uh, is the correct model for uh, level quantum gravity with C between 1 and 25. Um, and uh, some um, uh, justification for our model can be found in uh, a recent work uh, by Ang Park, Pepper and uh, Sheffield. Uh, so, uh, on Park, Pepper, and Sheffield, uh, what they show is that um, the square subdivision plan a map for different values of uh, of c. Uh, they can be reweighted. Uh, they can be related by doing a reweighting uh, by the Laplace determinant. Uh, so, to be more precise, uh, what they do is that they um, let c be some real number. They let epsilon be uh, positive and let n be a natural number. And they uh, let M be uh, the planar map obtained by doing square subdivision um, with central charge uh, zero and square size of epsilon. And they also condition on the number of um, the number of vertices uh, to be equal or squares to be equal to, to N. Um, so, uh, so what they do, uh, then they uh, take this planar map and uh, they reweight uh, the probability measure uh, by the Laplacian determinant. Uh, so I will not uh, give the precise definition that they use of the Laplacian determinant, um, but I can mention that it's uh, based upon um, considering a particular smooth approximation uh, to the Gaussian free field, uh, and then applying something which is known as the Polyakov alvarez uh, formula. Uh, okay, so they consider this Laplacian determinant and they reweight the probability measure by this, this, this Laplacian determinant to the power minus c over two. And then they show that under this uh, reweighted probability measure, uh, then uh, the planar map uh, has the law of the planar map obtained by doing square subdivision with central charge C uh, and conditioned on uh, the number of vertices to be equal uh, to N. Uh, so in other words, they, they argue that the square subdivision planar map uh, for different C are related upon doing uh, reweighting by this uh, Laplacian uh, determinant. Uh, which, is, which is explaining why uh, this square subdivision of planar map is a natural model for uh, LQG uh, when, C is, uh, when C is greater than one, uh, because it is related uh, to the corresponding square subdivision upon doing a reweighting by, by this Laplacian determinant. Uh, okay, so um, uh, what sort of results uh, are we able to prove about uh, the model? Um, so, uh, so the first result um, is it, we can prove um, is that uh, is a result which is suggesting that um, the dimension of uh, a level quantum gravity surface in this parameter range uh, is uh, is infinite. Uh, so what we show is that if you look at the volume of uh, a metric ball, uh, then this is growing uh, faster than any uh, than any power of uh, of the radius. Uh, heuristically speaking, uh, we see this uh, super polynomial uh, growth um, because uh, our uh, planar map, it, it behaves in, in some ways similar to a supercritical Galton Watson tree. Uh, so to be a bit more precise, in these regions uh, where we keep subdividing squares forever, uh, then the planar map of squares uh, is reminiscent of a supercritical uh, Galton Watson tree. So supercritical Galton Watson tree has exponential growth and we're able to prove uh, super polynomial growth also in, uh, in our setting. 
Um, so how do we how do we prove this result? So um, so the proof involves to consider what we call big squares and what we call small squares. Uh, so a big square is a square which has side length at least epsilon to the power one over q, uh, where q is this uh, background charge. Uh, while a small square has side length at most epsilon to the power k, where k is a parameter that I will be introducing uh, in a minute. Uh, so the first uh, step uh, of, of the proof is to argue that uh, large squares are well connected. Uh, so by that I mean that if we consider any two large squares in the square subdivision, uh, then they have a distance which is a polynomial in this uh, square size uh, epsilon. Um, okay, so. Um, um, yeah, so, uh, so, uh, so you can ask how, uh, how we prove this. Uh, so the idea of the proof is to consider uh, Gaussian free field level lines. Uh, so since the Gaussian free field is a dis distribution and not a function, it's not obvious uh, what, uh, what a level line means. Uh, but it is possible to define level lines of the Gaussian free field uh, rigorously. Uh, so in particular, uh, one can say that, uh, the, say that uh, the level zero level line, it, it describes the interface between uh, the Gaussian free field taking positive and uh, negative values. Uh, so Gaussian free field uh, level lines, they were uh, studied in, in works of Schramm and uh, Sheffield, uh, and they proved in particular that uh, Gaussian free field level lines, uh, they have, uh, they look locally like, um, uh, what is uh, locally like uh, the random fractal curves, which are known as uh, schramm lorentz revolutions, uh, where the parameter kappa of uh, the SOE is, uh, has, uh, is equal to four. Uh, so in particular, it's possible to argue that these uh, Gaussian free field level lines are macroscopic, uh, and we can argue that we can uh, connect any two big squares uh, by some curves, which are very closely related to Gaussian free field uh, level lines. Uh, so we know that along a Gaussian free field level line, then the Gaussian free field is approximately constant. Um, it is approximately of constant order. So in particular, the Gaussian free field is not, uh, there is nowhere along this level line where the Gaussian free field is, uh, is taking a very uh, large value. Uh, so this means uh, that along the Gaussian free field level lines, then we, then we are able to control quite well uh, the, the square size in the square subdivision model. Because we know that the Gaussian free field is typically uh, has a magnitude of order one, so that there is there is nowhere that we will see uh, a huge number of small squares, which forces us, uh, which forces the path between the squares uh, to be very long. Um, yeah, so this is the first step uh, of of the proof. Um, so then the second uh, step is that we argue that we can find a huge collection of small squares, uh, which are close to some, uh, such that any of these small squares are close to one of the big squares. Uh, so when I say that I consider many small squares, what I mean is that, um, uh, is that uh, it, it is polynomial um, uh, in epsilon, such that we can make, um, make uh, the degree of the polynomial arbitrarily large. Um, uh, and this is based on picking some point where the Gaussian free field is very large. So there, are so there are lots of points, a dense set of points where the Gaussian free field is very large. We pick one of these points and we, and we can argue that near these points where the GFF is very large, we can typically find some small square. And then we argue again using uh, level lines that this, uh, that this square can be connected to a big square. Uh, then uh, the next step is to argue that uh, the origin uh, is close to a uh, big square. Uh, this is done by a rather similar argument as in the second bullet point. Uh, and then combining these uh, three results and applying uh, the triangle inequality, uh, then one can argue that there is uh, a polynomial uh, number of squares which have a polynomial distance uh, from the origin, uh, where the degree of the first polynomial can be chosen to be uh, arbitrarily large. Yeah, so that was the first result. Um, so the second result is uh, that we argue that point-to-point uh, -point distances are uh, polynomial uh, in the square size. Um, yeah, so we consider two points, uh, Z1 and Z2, uh, and we consider the associated squares, and we can argue that uh, the distance between these two points is, uh, is polynomial in, uh, in epsilon. Uh, a recent work of uh, Ding and Gwyn, uh, they get tightness for such point-to-point uh, -point distances, um, uh, but they are considering another model uh, for Lee-Wolf quantum gravity with C greater than one than we are doing. Uh, they're considering a model which is known as Lee-Wolf first passive percolation. 
uh, it is uh, so it is so conjecturally uh, Lee will first passage percolation um, and our model uh, for C greater than one uh, are equivalent in the scaling limit but there are a few rigorous uh, relationships uh, between these two models Um, so this, uh, so I want to briefly introduce this Lee Wolf first passage percolation, uh, which is an alternative model for uh, C greater than one. Uh, so in Lee Wolf first passage percolation, uh, then uh, one defines uh, the distance between two points uh, by considering a uh, by uh, considering a path between the two points, then integrating uh, e to the power uh, xi times the Gaussian free field uh, along this path, uh, where xi is some parameter, uh, and then one takes the infimum over all paths connecting the two points. Um, yeah. Uh, so then, um, uh, so, so and as before, uh, h sub uh, epsilon uh, is, is denoting some uh, regularized version of, of h. Uh, so then, when c is uh, smaller than one, um, then uh, and uh, and the parameter psi is equal to the ratio of the parameter gamma and the Hausdorff dimension of uh, of uh, the Lie-Wolf quantum gravity surface. Uh, then uh, it has been proved uh, that this Lee-Wolf first uh, passage percolation distance uh, it converges in probability to the Lee-Wolf quantum uh, gravity metric. So this is actually how the Lee-Wolf quantum gravity metric uh, was constructed. Uh, first, one proved tightness for this uh, Lee-Wolf first passage percolation distance, uh, and then one proved uh, uniqueness of subsequential limits. Um, so then in this work of Ding and Gwyn, uh, they show that when uh, xi is uh, greater than some uh, critical parameter, uh, then this Lee will first passive percolation distance is tight uh, for a particular topology on uh, lower semi-continuous uh, functions. Uh, this xi critical, uh, it, it corresponds uh, to, uh, to the case when, uh, when c is equal to 1. Uh, so we just do the ratio between gamma and, uh, the, uh, and the dimension d when, when c is equal to 1. Uh, so, so, we, so we don't know um, uh, we don't know uh, the dimension d sub c. Uh, so therefore, uh, the, the particular numerical value for xi critical uh, is not known. Um, so they're, they're also arguing that if um, uh, if we consider some subsequential uh, limit, uh, then if we consider two fixed points, uh, then uh, then uh, the distance between these two points uh, is finite. Um, but if we uh, pick uh, one point, which is one of these infinite uh, mass points uh, of our surface, uh, then this will have uh, infinite distance from all the other points. Uh, so we can see that uh, the picture that, uh, they are, that their subsequential limits uh, are describing is very similar to the heuristic picture I, I was giving uh, earlier with, uh, with our model. Uh, and conjecturally, uh, uh, this uh, subsequential uh, limit is, uh, is unique. Um, um, so, uh, so it's possible um, uh, possible to argue that um, uh, via analytic continuation that uh, xi greater than xi critical uh, corresponds to the central type C being greater than one, uh, but I will not be going into that uh, in this talk. Um, okay, so um, we also show that uh, our model is satisfying some variant of uh, the KPC formula. Uh, so the KBZ formula uh, is um, a formula derived heuristically in the physics literature in the 80s, uh, which allows to relate uh, the Euclidean dimension and uh, the Lee-Wolf quantum uh, gravity dimension of a random fractal. Uh, so to describe what uh, the KBZ formula means, uh, we'll let x be some uh, fractal uh, in the unit square. Uh, it may be random, but it should be independent of, of the background uh, Gaussian free field H. Um, so in the left part of the figure, you can see that I have divided the unit square into smaller squares, so side length uh, epsilon. Uh, if the number of uh, such squares uh, intersecting our fractal is epsilon to the power minus d sub x, uh, then we say that um, d sub x is the Euclidean dimension uh, of our fractal. Um, uh, we can proceed similarly in uh, the right figure to obtain uh, the Lie-Wolf quantum gravity dimension of the fractal. Uh, so if the number of squares in the square subdivision model intersecting the fractal uh, is of order epsilon to the power minus d sub x superscript, superscript c, uh, then we say that d sub x superscript c uh, is the Lie-Wolf quantum uh, gravity dimension of, uh, of the fractal. Uh, the KPC formula is an explicit uh, quadratic formula which uh, relates these two, uh, these two notions of uh, dimension. Um, so it was first derived heuristically uh, by physicists, and then um, in more recent years, uh, various rigorous versions uh, have been proved by, by mathematicians. 
Uh, one typical uh, application of the KPC formula is that it can be used uh, to predict uh, the Euclidean uh, dimension of uh, random fractals. Uh, in many cases, it's possible to um, to calculate uh, to calculate um, uh, the legal quantum gravity dimension of a fractal by using combinatorics uh, on a planar map, and by plugging into the KPC formula, one one then gets uh, the Euclidean dimension of uh, the fractal. Um, so we show that uh, some variant of uh, the KPC formula is holding for our square subdivision model. Uh, so we have some fractal uh, X with dimension D sub X, and we show that uh, the Lyell quantum uh, gravity dimension of this fractal is what one would expect uh, according to the KPC formula. Uh, if um, the Euclidean dimension is greater than uh, Q squared over two, uh, then uh, the Lyell quantum uh, uh, then the KPC formula uh, is giving a complex answer. Uh, and then we show that uh, the Lyell quantum uh, gravity dimension is uh, is infinite. Uh, it's possible to argue that this happens uh, if and only if uh, the fractal X is intersecting uh, one of these points of infinite mass uh, that I was discussing earlier. Uh, okay, so uh, in the remaining time, uh, I want to discuss a few open problems. Um, so uh, one first problem is to um, is to prove scaling limit results for uh, planar maps reweighted by the Laplace indeterminant to some power, or alternatively, planar maps whose law is reweighted by the partition function of some statistical physics model. Uh, so, as we saw earlier, uh, this uh, this is only partially understood, also in the case when c is uh, less than one. Uh, one can also prove to try to prove scaling limit results for uh, coarse grained uh, versions of Lyell quantum gravity. Uh, for example, one can uh, try to prove uh, that uh, the square subdivision in planar map is converging in some sense as uh, a metric measure space. Uh, one can also ask about uh, combinatorial um, random planar map models uh, for C between uh, 1 and uh, 25. Uh, so you may remember that when C is uh, smaller than one, uh, then uh, then it is believed that uh, Lyell quantum uh, gravity for, for this parameter range it arises the scaling limit of random planar maps, uh, reweighted by the partition function of some statistical uh, physics model. Uh, uh, but if C is greater than one, then it is believed that such uh, planar maps uh, they converge to uh, the continuum random tree in the scaling limit. But we can ask whether there are any natural combinatorial random planar map models which are in the same universality class uh, as this planar map of squares, uh, which was considered in uh, in this talk. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this, uh, so in particular, this um, uh, such a model should allow for planar maps uh, that have uh, infinite infinite total volume. Uh, so we can also ask uh, questions directly in the continuum. Um, so uh, you may remember that when C is greater than one, then the parameter gamma is complex. Uh, and we can ask whether it's possible to make sense of uh, e to the power uh, gamma h uh, times uh, Lebesgue area measure. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, uh, so e to the power gamma h, it has actually been made sense of uh, for certain uh, complex values of, uh, of gamma. Um, uh, but uh, but you may remember that C being between 1 and 25 uh, corresponds to gamma being um, complex with modulus 2 uh, and this particular um, uh, and the particular case when the modulus of gamma is equal to is, is outside uh, the range where this uh, where e to the power gamma h uh, has been made sense of. Uh, if one managed to make sense of, uh, of e to the power gamma h uh, for gamma complex, one can also ask whether there, there are any relationships between that object and this uh, square subdivision planar map considered in, in this talk. Uh, we can also ask about the path integral approach uh, to label quantum gravity when c is greater than 1. Um, so uh, the field uh, age, which um, which we were um, considering in this talk, uh, was a Gaussian free field. Um, so the field uh, which is arising, um, which is describing the scaling limit of random planar maps, is actually not an exact Gaussian free field, uh, but it is rather a variant of the Gaussian free field, which is obtained by doing some uh, by doing some uh, reweighting of of its law. Um, uh, and uh, so one way to uh, to, to precisely uh, define the, the field which is arising in the scaling limit results is via the path integral approach. 
so the idea of the Python neural approach uh, is to consider a Lebesgue measure on the space of, of functions. Uh, then, and then reweighting this by e to the power minus uh, what is called uh, the Lie wheel action, which is uh, denoted by S sub L on, on the slide. Um, yeah, so, uh, so, this, uh, different, so this construction does not make rigorous sense, um, for example, because Lebesgue measure on the space of functions um, is, it does not make rigorous sense. Um, but this Pythagorean approach, path approach has been made rigorous, for example, in work of uh, David Kupiain and Rhodes and, uh, and Vargas. And we can ask whether uh, there is a way to make sense of this uh, in the case when uh, the parameter c is, is greater than one. Um, so one obstacle uh, is, that, is that you can see that this uh, parameter gamma, um, which is complex, uh, is appearing in, in the Liouville action uh, for this parameter range. Uh, so one can also ask about uh, from learn revolutions uh, for c greater than one. Um, yeah, so uh, the SLE is one parameter family of random practical curves, which describe uh, the scaling limit of statistical physics models, and uh, an SLE is associated with the parameter kappa. Uh, so for each value of kappa, uh, there is an associated value of, uh, of a central charge C, such that uh, kappa being uh, greater than 1, it corresponds to C being uh, less than or equal to 1. Uh, so if we're given some uh, value of the central charge less than or equal to one, uh, then there are a number of interesting couplings and relationships uh, between SLE and Liouville quantum gravity uh, with this value of, of the central charge. Um, and, and, and one can ask uh, whether one can make sense of SLE in some way for C greater than one, and whether there are any relationships between uh, this and the associated uh, Liouville quantum uh, gravity surface. Uh, so there are various models converging to SLE, which or uh, which are believed to converge to SLE, which also makes sense for um, for C greater than uh, one, um, but it's not. Uh, but, but but they don't seem to have uh, scaling limits in the same sense as when uh, C is less than or equal to one. Uh, so finally, we can ask about uh, the physical meaning of uh, vari various various um, complex numbers obtained by our analytic uh, continuation. Uh, so there are various um, various uh, formulas uh, that make uh, that describe Liouville quantum gravity when c is uh, less than one, uh, and these, if we'll analytically continue them, then these often give uh, complex answers, such as we saw in, for example, the KBC formula. And we can ask whether these uh, complex numbers have any uh, have any physical meaning. Okay, so that uh, that was the end. Thank you very much, Nina. Yeah. Um, thank you. I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions and perhaps I can start us off with one. Um, okay. So referring back to the, the sort of discrete model that you started with of planar maps reweighted yeah. by, let's say, a power of the number of spanning trees. Yeah. Yeah. You said that there's this, this belief that yeah. that should somehow be the partition function of the statistical physics model. Is there some intuition for why that should be the case? Um, Is there a heuristic there? So, uh, well, so I guess in uh, in uh, so I guess it's a little bit different per uh, for uh, depending on which model that one considers. Um, so in the case of uh, of the Gaussian free field, one can argue that it's that it's actually an identity. Uh, then of course one can um, it's also natural to consider the spanning tree, and uh, and then it's also an identity. I when also um, so when it comes comes to, for example, the Ising model, then there are certain results on Euclidean lattices, which gives uh, some results relating these two. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure I can give any sort of uh, general um, uh, general way of relating these two. Um, but there are uh, it's a little bit case by case depending on uh, on the model. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thank you. And then there was a question that came up in the chat. I don't know if Marie wants to ask it in person. Marie, I'm going to unmute you or ask, let you unmute yourself if you would like to ask it out loud or I can do it. Okay, there was a question, what is delta in yes, the... Yes, I was just wondering what is the, if you have any intuition of what is the analog of delta and the uh, completely continuous setting. Um, uh, which parameter? In the work of Ang Park, Pfeffer and Sheffield. Yeah, yeah. You say that they studied uh, LQG with the um, 
uh, maybe slightly later. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's. Mm, yeah, here it no, is. No, it was before that. Um, okay. Let me check. I guess. There we go. Yeah. So I had, yeah, I guess I mentioned it a few different times. Oh yes, and 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 there you gave. I mean, I asked the question at the beginning of the talk, okay. and I think you yeah. gave some of the uh, answer there. Uh, I mentioned it here as well. Uh, yes, that's the first one where it appeared, just there. Yeah. Um, so you have this uh, delta d determinant of delta here for for yeah. L on LQG. And oh, I see. Oh, okay. So the question is how it, how is it defined? Mm -hmm. uh, so, that's yeah, very, uh, so, that, uh, so that's a very good question. So that's, I guess, what I, I'm sort of, yeah, I didn't really explain it. I gave slightly more details in the following uh, here, uh, but it's, um, uh, so the way, uh, so the way it is defined. Um, so, so the idea is um, that one considers uh, the Gaussian free field H and then mm -hmm. one projects the Gaussian free field uh, onto a space of smooth functions. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the way they the way they do it is that they um, that they condition on the average of the Gaussian free field on uh, on each square in the square subdivision, and then they say conditional on this collection of averages. What is the conditional expectation of the Gaussian free field? They somehow get some sort of smooth approximation to the Gaussian free field. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once they have this smooth approximation, uh, then they can use uh, something known as the Polyakov Alvarez formula to uh, to, uh, to to specify what this uh, Laplace indeterminant uh, should be. Um, yeah, in the continuum, it's related to say the regularized uh, Laplace indeterminant. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll have to look it up. But thanks. Okay. Can't see any other questions coming up in the chat, or I, I can't see any raised hands. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm I'm going to stop recording, um, and then I'm going to invite.